Father, I thank you so much for today. Lord, I pray that you would just open our eyes to uh, the promises of your return, uh, that Yeshua, you're coming for us, and uh, your return is near. So Lord, help us to have eyes to see. Show us things that we haven't known before concerning your word, your prophetic word, in the name of Yeshua. Amen. All right, so um, about two weeks ago, I was trying to go to bed, and uh, I couldn't sleep, and uh, the Lord just basically threw this whole comma Ellen in my head. I didn't really even know too much about it, but I couldn't sleep at all that night, and I stayed up, and I read, and I studied, and uh, that was the night I put out that prophecy blog um, that you saw on 7 Theory, so uh, from there, I basically, you can ask my wife, uh, she'll tell you that I pretty much have just been in Ellen world for like two weeks, so uh, this is probably, I'm going to say, probably the most significant, most important prophetic uh, teachings I've ever done. And so I think by the time you see all of what's entailed in this, uh, you may feel the same way. Um, so we've got to cut through a lot of, um, a lot of what uh, is false information on the internet. So uh, who here has heard of Kama Elenin? Has everyone heard of that? It's like the most buzzed uh, comet that's ever existed. On, uh, on Google and all that. It's just getting crazy hits. Uh, and Nibiru, have you guys heard that? Okay, cool. And then uh, The Day of the Lord. You guys heard that? Okay, cool. So, Kama Elenin, Nibiru, Planet X, and The Day of the Lord. That's what this message is titled. And um, just a little bit of facts about Kama Elenin, so, um, so we're on the, on the same page. Um, it, was, it was allegedly found by a uh, amateur, amateur astronomer out of Russia, uh, but he was using a remote, sat, uh, a, a remote um, uh, facility here in New Mexico. Uh, and so that was uh, found on December 10th, 2010. So if you look up Comet Elenin on Wikipedia, that's what you'll find, that his name is uh, Leonid Elenin, and uh, it was founded on uh, December 10th of 2010. So that's what you'll find on Wikipedia, and what I want to do is kind of uh, dab at that a little bit and go, okay, do we believe just everything that's there just because it's in Wikipedia, or is there more to it? Um, and if you, if you look at the cosmic name, if you're into astronomy programs, the cosmic name is C slash 2010 space X1. So I had no idea what that meant about two weeks ago. So I've been on quite the learning curve. So... Um, now, if you, if you also go on Wikipedia, you'll see that the nucleus of this comet is about three to four kilometers wide, is what they're saying. And um, as of August 2011, the coma or the gas and the dirt, uh, that width, uh, it, it's just been growing. And now it's up to about 200,000 kilometers, is what they're saying that that the coma of the El comet Ellen is. Um, and let's see. Uh, then you have the other side of the camp. Some people... So you got the story that this is just a comet, um, and NASA says that it's, it's rather wimpy, that it's really not really worth even paying attention to, essentially. Um, and then you have the other side of the camp, and you have people on YouTube and, and on Google and blogs, and they're saying, hey, this is a brown dwarf star. This isn't wimpy. This is catastrophic. This is totally different from anything we've ever seen before. So where do you, where do you start with that? Is this thing just a comet? Or is it a brown dwarf star? Is this wimpy? Or is it really something that is uh, once in a lifetime? So that's what I started digging through a couple weeks ago. And we're going to kind of pry into some of the things that I found along the way. So here's Wikipedia. And here's, like I said, you're going to see um, the Russian astronomer who found it. He's an amateur. Um, and that, you know, it's exactly what I said. It has a, a, the nucleus is three to four kilometers wide and yada, yada, yada. All right, um, this is the guy, this is the astronomer, Leonard Elenin, who is, uh, allegedly found this, um, and that's under great debate, too. If you study it under Google, that's like, well, did he? Is he a real person? Who is this guy? Um, we're going to open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and this is definitely um, uh, a passage that... Um, the Lord wanted us to know, especially in the day that we live in, um, because this talks about the day of the Lord that's approaching. And there's two types of people. There's people who are 
totally awake and paying attention and understanding the hours that we live in. And then there's a people who have no clue and they're living carelessly. And all of a sudden the day of the Lord comes upon them like a thief. But, the, but those who were watching, they knew when the, when the season that the day of the Lord was coming. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, uh, starting in verse 1, uh, Paul writes, Now to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying, Peace and safety. Then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that this day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do sleep. They're sleeping at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For as God not, has not destined us to wrath, but for obtaining salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. So last time we met, we talked about the armor of God, and I think it's going to be extremely important for everyone right now to be thinking about the helmet of salvation, about final salvation. Jesus promised he's coming for us. We sung about that. He said he's, he's preparing a place for us right now. It's, like, it's extremely important that you have that on your head right now, because some of the stuff we're going to look at can be scary. But look at me. I'm not freaking out, okay? Why? Because I have a helmet of salvation. I know Jesus is coming. Okay, so if you start to get scared, relax. Okay, Jesus is coming. Helmet of salvation, we're good. All right? So this passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it compares these two people. It compares the person who's living carelessly, who's not really paying attention, and the world is saying peace and safety. Okay? So this is the time period where the world is really saying peace and safety, everything's cool. The economy's getting better. That's what they'll say. Um, or, uh, you know, there's, there's no problem with Israel. You know, that's not a big deal. We're going to just divide the land. And uh, the, is, the, the Jews and the Palestinians, they'll live side by side. It's going to be great. Lots of peace. Don't buy it. Okay? Because we have an enemy that wants you to believe that tomorrow will be the same as today. And the day after that will be the same after that. But that's a complete lie. If you read the Word of God, it tells us that where we're headed is totally unlike any other time period that's ever existed. There's never been a worse time in the past than what's coming. And there never will be as bad a time in the future of what's coming. So we need to have that, that frame, that reference of mind so that we're not deceived because the enemy wants you to believe that everything is fine and tomorrow's going to be the same as today. Your 401k, oh, it's going to be there. Trust me, Satan says. Your house, it's going to be there. Trust me. Okay, so start thinking that way as the enemy is trying to get you to think that everything's fine and everything will be uh, the same tomorrow. All right. Now, okay, the controversy. Uh, you're going to see two big camps. Some people are saying, yeah, this is the guy. This is the astronomer. This is Leonard Ellenin. He, he found the comet, um, and case closed. It's done. You have a whole other camp uh, who says, actually, uh, he's a fictitious person. He's uh, like a, a plant by one of those lettered agencies, right? And he's not real. He's a figment. Because what really uh, Leonard Ellenin stands for is um, uh, a meteor shower that comes out of the constellation of Leo. Okay? Leonid is actually Leo with a, with a meteor shower. And then Ellenin is, actually stands for extinction level event. Nibiru is near. You go, whoa, what, what, what is that? I'd like to believe this guy's a real guy and say everything's fine, right? That doesn't sound good. Extinction level whatever. Uh, so we need to really investigate, okay, what is the truth behind all this, and what, what, what can we know? So moving forward, uh, there was a video that came out of uh, Leonardo Elenin, and he was in Russia, and it's not in English, so if you look it up on YouTube, you're not going to understand anything he says. But you can see him, and there's 
there's been researchers that says there's no way that's the same guy. This guy's not cross-eyed. This guy is on the video, and he's not looking straight. And so there's definitely a debate on whether this is truly uh, Leonard Ellen and the discoverer of, of the comet, just so you know. This is all stuff I found two week, you know, within the last two weeks. And some of this might be boring, but I'm telling you this is going to lead to somewhere really cool. So the, we're going to have a series of videos before we start this video, I want you to understand something. There's, there was an operation called, um, what happened there? Okay, there was something called Operation Paperclip. Has anyone ever heard of that? Okay, Operation Paperclip happened after Nazi Germany. So as Nazi Germany was coming under trial, and they were going to put all of those evil people on trial, the US government goes, wait a second, they have technology on rockets and stuff that we really want. So. What we did as a country is we went in and we took the top 1,500 um, uh, r r rocket guys, for lack of a better term, okay? All the, all the engineers that, that made those fabulous rockets, we brought those into America, okay? And we're going to see where they ended up. The first to arrive at this place was an 18-year-old American GI by the name of Hugh Carey, who later became governor in New York State. And he said when they arrived, what they discovered lying at their feet was thousands and thousands and thousands of dead bodies. And come to find out, 25,000 of the 40,000 slaves at this place perished at the hands of the Nazis. Well, you know, immediately after the war, the U.S. and the Allies created the Nuremberg Trials, at which time we brought the Nazis to justice for their crimes against humanity. But 1,500 of the top Nazis never went to trial. They were smuggled into the United States by the U.S. military in a, under a program called Operation Paperclip, smuggled in through Boston and West Palm Beach, Florida. And Werner von Braun and his rocket team, a hundred of them, along with 100 copies of the V-2 rocket, were sent to Huntsville, Alabama, where von Braun became the first director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. What's interesting is the other 1,400 Nazis, who were they? Well, some of them were brought to the United States to work for the CIA. Others were brought to the United States to do the LSD drug experiments and the MK Ultra mind experiments during the 1960s where people were jump jumping out of windows. Some of the uh, Nazi scientists that in Germany had been taking Jews and putting them in freezing temperatures to see how the body would react to that were sent to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and were put in charge of the U.S. military flight medicine program. And so when you uh, take 1,500 of the top Nazi scientists and essentially seed the military industrial complex, the question I have is, do they bring with them an ideological contamination? All right, so if you didn't know that, that's some history that uh, you won't read in textbooks, but that American history is actually littered with things that you go, what? In America? Yeah, in America, okay? Um, and the reason I bring this up is because we're going to be talking a lot about the organization NASA tonight. So in order for us to have a really good idea about uh, how to weigh in information, we need to have some background knowledge. So that's why I brought that out. Does that make sense? Okay. So I'm not trying to bash uh, America or anything like that. I just want you guys to understand some things. Okay. There are some things that have occurred in the last several months that are very suspicious, that don't make sense. Um, and so I just want to list some of those things that you go, wait a second, why would they do that? Why did that happen? And so one of the things that has occurred is there is a there is an um, awesome telescope in space called the WISE telescope. And uh, this actually was taken down offline. And there was no reason why. They didn't actually say, okay, we're taking it down because it's broken or anything like that. No, they just took it down. And um, this has the ability to see space in an infrared mode, which is really uh, important when you start looking for asteroids and comets that might be on a trajectory that would affect the Earth. So when they took this down, that's very suspicious because this is like the best of the best of what we have. 
why did they take it down when we really need to be watching and watching for some objects? I mean, it was only up for like, I think it went up on, uh, in 2009, and it found more comets and more things than any of the other telescopes prior to it. It's leaps and bounds.